Monday, 8.30 p.m. session, Manley Beasley. is going to come and bring the first message of the evening. I've been anticipating hearing and preaching this meeting. I'm thrilled over what the Lord's done for him physically, and I'm sure that as we progress this, that he'll share some of that with you. But as far as I'm concerned, Brother Manley has blessed me more than any other man in the ministry with the Word of God. And I'm delighted and thrilled to have him tonight come and bring the first message of this Bible conference. Brother Manley, you come. glad it's Japanese because that's the only kind you can get a guarantee on. <clears throat> well, it is a blessing to be here. It's always a real joy to be at this conference. Uh, it means so much to me personally. And it's always a joy to be here, to be back here. And um, I have known of some of my greatest times right here. And it is the first time I've been here. I don't know if ever in February, but anyway, it's certainly a blessing, or at least a long time, I should say, not never. But um, I'm a little out of breath uh, because I was thinking I was going to preach last tonight, and they had to, they heard me up a little bit, and I'm old and sought in my ways, and uh, I have to catch my breath a little bit, so you'll give me a moment or two, and uh, I, we, we might get stirred up before the week's out. I'm looking forward to these days. I, I, when I am getting to speak several times, and I, I'm sure of it, I like to have the mind of God in which direction I like to go. And tonight I'd like to um, deal with an issue that I believe is one of the major issues that we face this hour as in, in the Christian world. I believe it was an issue when Jesus came along and I believe it's still an issue. I think it's more of an issue tonight than you realize. Now, I'm literally standing here by the operation of some laws. I mean literally, physically, spiritually. I wouldn't want you to separate them. I am here because of the law of osmosis. And uh, if you don't understand what that means, don't ask me. And then I am here by the law, I understand, of diffusion. Right. Don't ask me what that means. But I'm also here by the law of redemption. Now, I trust you know what that means. <clears throat> and this is literally to the case. And tonight, what I want to deal with is what you know, you would expect me to deal with if I uh, had to start somewhere, and that's the beginning, at the beginning of something. And I'd like to start tonight with the first message of the gospel. And far as I know, it's the only message of the gospel. And it's the final message of the gospel. John the Baptist came preaching it. Jesus continued to preach it. Peter, all the apostles preached it. <clears throat> Paul preached it. John in the book of Revelation preached it. What is it? The first word of the gospel. John the Baptist said it. He said it in Matthew 3, 2, and saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judah, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord Jesus, in Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter, in Acts 2.38, you're so familiar with that passage, I'm sure, tells the people to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Paul, throughout the entire epistles, he talks about repentance. But in Acts 26, 19, Paul is standing before Agrippa, and he gives the heart of his message as he says, Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judah and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul preached repentance. And John in the book of Revelation in 2.5, he said, Repent and do thy first works. And John 3 also, he said, Repent. The message of repentance is throughout the New Testament. And you really could go out and establish this message all the way through the Old Testament. But I think um, uh, it's adequate tonight to just say that it's repentance is the first message of the gospel, the word repentance. Now, what I want to do tonight, because in our society, and I'll say a lot more about this, I'm sure, in our culture, in the last uh, 50 years, and I can only speak for the last 50, so that's all I'll speak for, I, I know, my dear friend, a lot of men who believe when you say you need to repent for this and that and the other, they, they believe it. But you never hear a message about repentance. In our society, we have developed a religion where we do not need God. We have developed in Baptist churches a religion where you do not need God. Now, you'd have no problem handling that if we're talking about the liberal element. You would hurriedly say at this congregation, amen. Because a liberal element says all you need to do is just have social action and meet needs people socially and meet their needs socially. That's all you've got to do. That's it. And beloved, that's about the essence of their uh, religious activity is a social environment without ever mentioning the fact you must be born again. You must repent. You must be born of the Spirit. And you may not believe it, my dear friend, but on the other side of the spectrum among the conservative people, we have not done away with the deity of Jesus, but we have so humanized the way to get to him that, my dear friends, you can get to God by intellectual gymnastics and emotional stimulation and never have to have God and join the church and be baptized because you thoroughly comprehend it intellectually and you have had some kind of emotional involvement possibly here or there. Maybe shed a few tears when somebody sang a certain song. And because, my dear friends, we have developed us a religion that we do not need to repent and be born again, we have filled our churches full of people who do not know experientially the message of repentance and neither, my dear friends, do we need God because we got the people and if you can get the money, you got it. And that's success. Success means money and people, people and money. That's all you need. You don't need God. No, you can get them in. You can get them in. You can get them in. You take this little plan of salvation and lay it out there where they can understand it intellectually. I'm a sinner. Jesus is a Savior. You give them a little something they can do and they can do it. Tiptoe in the church, be baptized and become your best member and never repent. My dear friends, you can get you a bunch of people in that'll stir them up and move them up emotionally and get them squalling and bawling and running up and down the aisles or hooping and a hollering. And my dear friends, reach out with a hand and shake their hand and say, you must have met God. 
baptize them, they think they met God because of some kind of emotional sensation they had a meeting. The Bible says repent. The Bible says repent. And I've got news for you tonight. The liberals are not filling the churches. It's the conservatives that have humanized the way to get to him. Yes, sir, brother. Preacher said to me one time, wrote a great book about 25 years ago. It was the bestseller. He said, Brother Manley, said, what do you think of that book? I said, it's good. He said, uh, my greatest ambition is life, make a plan of salvation so simple a little child can understand it. I said, and when you do, you'll become the biggest devil I know. I don't know why preachers try to make the gospel more simple than God did. You see, we live in two worlds, my dear friends, a, a physical world and a spirit world. And the physical world you're well acquainted with. And to get in the spiritual world, the the world where God is, and to know God, no amount of intellectual gymnastics or emotional involvement is going to get you there. The Bible simply says you must be born again. He puts it another way. He says you must be born of the Spirit. It doesn't make any difference what you understand. It doesn't make any difference what you feel. If you've hung from ten dozen chandeliers, my friends, if you've never been born again, never been born of the Spirit, you'll not enter into the kingdom of God. And in order to get to the kingdom of God and have and maintain a proper relationship and fellowship in that kingdom of God, you have to learn how to, rep you have to repent and learn how to keep on repenting. Not to stay in it, but to stay properly related to it. You have to repent. Now I want to give you a definition of repentance that will ap out apply throughout this message tonight. The first word in repentance that I want to deal with in defining the word repentance is the word conviction. <clears throat> now when I say the word conviction, I do not mean uh, convinced intellectually. That's too light of a word. I'm talking about something that's deeper than being convinced intellectually. When I talk about uh, the word convinced, con uh, conviction, I'm saying a true knowledge of yourself. The word repentance, the first word in the definition of repentance is a true, is conviction. It means a true knowledge of yourself. You literally see yourself for what you are. You literally see what you are. You literally see it. You literally, you're not convinced of it by some logical uh, work of the mind. You are convinced of it by a work of God in your being. And the amazing thing about it is, even though it's a work within your spirit and in your being, it's a work of God and it has to come from God, but yet God commands us to repent. That's not strange because a lot of his commandments are impossible apart from him. So he says repent, seeing yourself as you really are. We see ourselves as we are. That's the first word in the word repentance. The second word in the word repentance is contrition. Now I'm not given to homiletics, but I'm giving you a definition that I have uh, looked over for many, many years, and so I'll just leave those C's there. 
not because I think you have to be homiletical. I think you need to minister life, <clears throat> whether your homiletize is or not. <clears throat> but, uh, but beloved, contrition means a change of mind because within you is a knowing what you are and a knowing of some object, usually God, and what he is and who he is and that he is. And you have a state where there is a change of mind about you and your condition and him, the object, whichever, him and his condition. There's a change of mind. I mean a distinct, absolute change of mind. Contrition. And then in the context of contrition and conviction comes the third word that defines repentance, and that's called conversion. There's no way that you can have faith without repentance. And there's no way that you can have real repentance without faith. And the third element in repentance is conversion. And conversion means on the basis of a change of mind, a state of sorrow where there's a change of mind about yourself and God, and knowing yourself for what you really are, there's a choice in your life, in your spirit. There's a choice in your inner being to an object, and that object is the Lord Jesus. Now I want you to go to the prodigal son to illustrate what I've said. You have your Bibles. Turn with me, please, to uh, the prodigal son, Luke 15. And I just want you to look at that passage. Now, tonight, as I deal with this passage... I want you to realize that, my dear friend, I personally believe that the message to the prodigal son is a lost, the man, the lost man. But I want you to tell this. I have heard preachers preach that this is a saved man coming back to God. Now, you know, when you preach the word of God, you first thing you want to run into in the Bible is the living Christ. And the second thing you want to see out of the word of God is the teachings of God. And the third thing you want to see is the principles by which God operates. And then you want to discover the promises by which he stands by to perform. And any time you find any passage of Scripture, you should find the life of Jesus because he's the living word. And I mean, this book lives. But you also find the teachings. And you also will find the principles by which God operates. And you'll also find the promises. Now, this passage of the prodigal son, in principle, is applicable to the lost man as well as the saved, or the saved as well as the lost. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you ever have revival, you'll have to come the same way that this prodigal son got saved. If you ever stay in revival, you'll have to come the same way. If you ever learn how to walk with God, you'll have to come just like you got saved. By repentance. So, it doesn't make any difference. You want to preach it to the lost or saved. It's going to apply either way. And I'm not twisting it. And principle is going to apply. But let's look at it. I'm just going to read part of it because you know this so by heart possibly. I trust you know the message. 17th verse said, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have heard enough to spare and I perish? Excuse me. How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, 
his father saw him and had compassion and read and fell on his neck and kissed him. And, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it up on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Boy, isn't that beautiful? Now here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the word conviction. True knowledge of yourself. The word conviction means you came to yourself. This man, it says, came to himself. He saw what he was. He literally saw for the first time what he genuinely was. You see, he said to his father, I want all that belongs to me. And he took all of his wealth, went out and threw it away, went out and lived like the devil. And my dear friends, when he threw it all away, he was broke and he needed a job. And the only job he could get was in the hog pen. And he not only got the job in the hog pen, but he was so bad off, folk, he had to eat the food in the hog pit. Now, I don't know about raising hogs too much, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm 57 years of age, and back until just the last few years, I never did see hog food too sophisticated. In fact, we had a name for it when we'd say, go slop the hogs. And this poor boy ended up not only slopping the hogs, but eating the slop. And the Bible says he came to himself. He saw what he really was. What does it take? It took the hog pen for him. My dear friend, repentance is a person first seeing what they really are. You know what then? He said, listen. He said, my father's servants have more bread than they need. He's not through thinking yet. He said, hey. He said, you know, I'm not, I don't only see what I am and what I can do with my life. He said, I see. He had a change of mind about his ability. He saw where he would lead, and that was to the hog pen, to bankruptcy. Nothing. Dead. He saw it. He had a change of mind about himself. And he also had a change of mind about his father. He did not go back and say, hey, I'm going to come and do you a favor, Father. I'm going to come back and be your boy. He didn't say that, folk. He came back. He had such a change of mind that he said, I am willing, in that hog pen, he said, I'm willing to go home and admit to my father that I have sinned and tell him I am willing to be one of his servants. I have never heard of such an asinine truth as some of these Baptist preachers running around here preaching that you can be saved without naming Jesus Christ as Lord. May God have mercy on your soul. You're so humanistic it'd be better for you to get out of the ministry quickly before you leave more souls to hell than you already have. My goodness alive. May God have mercy on your soul. Getting saved without naming him Lord. Now I know it's a matter of semantics with some people, but I'm going to tell you something, folk. You do not repent without having a change of mind about yourself and about your God. To where you are helpless nothingness and you have a change of mind about your ability to do it and you have a change of mind about his ability to do it and not only do it but su to submit to it 
Yes, sir. He didn't stop there. When he had that change of mind about himself and about his father and became willing to be a slave, he said, you know what? I'm going home. That was a choice in his heart. Amen. Amen. Now tell me what happened to that 130, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. I'm sure he wasn't fat. What happened to that whole body down in that pig pit? What happened to it? When he made that choice in that pig pen to go home, what happened to his whole body? This business of secret discipleship stuff. His whole body reacted to that choice. And he got up and headed to the Father. When the father saw him coming, my dear friend, he had a servant said, put a robe on him. Put a ring on him. They always told me a ring indicated eternalness. No starting, no stopping. Put shoes on him. Kill the fatted calf. Let's have a banquet. Repentance, his conviction, contrition, and conversion all put together, friend, and you can't separate it. It's all put together. John the Baptist came and said, Repent! Jesus said, Repent! Peter said, Repent! Paul said, Repent! John said, Repent! And the first message of the gospel tonight is to repent! no salvation apart from it. There's no fellowship apart from it. None whatsoever. That illustration, that definition of repentance will have to carry all the way through. You say, what should we repent of? What kind of repentance is there? There's a repentance unto salvation. I have never been so appalled in all of my life at what you call fundamentalism. You say, why are you so hard on fundamentalism? Because I guess I'm one of them. But I'm telling you, I've never been so appalled in all my life. They go to any little Sunday school class out here in these Baptist churches and you will hear them kids and you will hear preachers tell that little one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old darlings said now, tell Brother Manley how much you love Jesus. And teach those children that a humanistic affection is the same, same thing as a divine love. And if that is not, my dear friends, the heights of unscripturalness, I don't know what is. But look down sometimes. It'll go off. Everything will go off if you wait long enough. <laughs> I'll even shut up if you wait long enough. <laughs> it's going to be hard to get over what I'm going to say tonight. I've watched them, folk. I've watched everybody teach a little old children that humanistic love, affection, is the same thing as divine love. That's humanism, folk. And teaching them that an intellectual state of mind about God, faith, is the same thing as saving faith. No wonder they can't tell you when they got saved. No wonder they don't have a testimony of when they got born again. 
because my dear friends have been taught in your Sunday school classes and in your home to love Jesus. You say, what are you supposed to tell them? Uh, if you teach them you love Jesus, you better tell them, sweetheart, until you get born again, you can't love Jesus. And you can't believe on Jesus till you get saved. <clears throat> you say, Brother Manly, what are you trying to tell me? I'm telling you, folk, the sooner they come to a true knowledge of themselves, the quicker they're going to get born again and be less confused. See, repentance unto salvation means that the Holy Spirit is come when He comes. And he, on the day of, he came on the day of Pentecost, but folk, on an individual life that's lost without Jesus, he comes individually. And my friends, when he comes individually and uses the preacher and uses the word of God and uses a testimony, uses a singer, he uses all kinds of instruments, but when the Holy Spirit is come, my dear friends, it's like a dagger, and he takes that dagger and slams it through the heart of that little nine or seven or eight or ninety-year-old person, and they're helpless. And they see themselves as they are. And it's not some little girl that's told a lie or some little boy that's stolen guilty of some sin they've committed. My dear friends, they see themselves as sinners. And you are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. And when the Holy Ghost brings conviction, folk, a true knowledge of yourself, you see yourself where you, that you are a sinner, where you're a nine-year-old virtuous little girl or a 90-year-old drunk. Many a person has walked down the aisle guilty of some kind of commit thing they've committed and they have had a state of sorrow, possibly because they've been caught. But it's not a sorrow, it's not a repentance under God. When the Holy Spirit has come, he broods over the soul like he brooded over the first face of the earth when it was without form and void. He makes them to know. It's not because they have come to some logical conclusion because you have given them a logical sequence of Scripture in your plan. If he uses that, very likely it's in spite of us. But my dear friends, the Holy Spirit has to come and take that word and convince that person. It's much deeper than the intellect. It's much deeper than the emotion. It's a knowing! You understand with your mind, but you know Something in your spirit. And even you are lost and dead in trespasses and sin, when the Spirit of God convicts, you know that you're a sinner. You see yourself as you really are. And when you see yourself as you really are, then you have grounds for changing the mind about yourself and about the Lord. Amen. When, I, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In other words, you don't see him with these naked eyes. So someone has to give you the ability to change your mind about him. And that he paid it all. He's the only hope. And you see yourself as you really are. And there's a change of mind about yourself. And your ability, as long as you've got one toe that'll work, you will never come to God. Not in repentance. Because it'll rebel. But you come to the end, have a change of mind about yourself and about God. You're ready to submit to Him as Lord. I mean, you give it all to Him. But it's not over yet. There's one more thing in that heart, in that inner being, in that person is a choice. It may happen back there in the seat. It may happen at the altar. 
It may happen anywhere, but there's a decision in your heart. Once and for all, I'm coming home. Yes, sir. Amen. And my dear friends, when you make that decision, wherever you are, when you believe in that heart, there's a confession with that mouth. And let's the world know you have come to him. It may be in private, but it'll get public. I can't believe it, my dear friend, in the last 50 years in this country. We have moved from 54 for a million more in 54. So just this week I talked to the head of the home mission board at the Southern Baptist Convention, and he said now it takes 55 Baptists just to get one church member. He said, what in the name of heaven's wrong, Brother Manley? He said, I know some of these men preaching the gospel. I said, the power of the Holy Spirit of God is nowhere around. My dear friends, you've got to be born of the Spirit. It's not a difficult thing. I've broken it down tonight in a step-by-step. -step. But it just simply takes a work of God in relationship to the work of man to get a person born again. There's a repentance unto salvation. But there's also a repentance unto forgiveness and cleansing. You could take this prodigal son again. And my dear friends, when a man is out of fellowship with God and he needs reviving, he needs straightening up, he has to come to himself. And he has to have a change of mind about his life and the way he's living it and about his Lord. And he has to come back with a decision in his heart to come back just like he got saved. No wonder Colossians 2, 6 says, as you received him, so walk ye in him. No wonder that message in the book of Revelation to the church, at the end of that a message, my dear friends, where he said, do something, he always said, repent. Why, man walked up to me some time ago in Houston, Texas, and asked me, said, Brother Manley, how do you get into the presence of God? i be honest with you, I thought he was a little nutty. I thought anyone knew how to get in the presence of God. I said, well, there's only one way to get in the presence of God, and that's to repent. He said, no, I've learned recently that you can just start praising God and get in his presence. You can praise God and he'll inhabit the praise of men. You better quit taking that verse out of the Old Testament and putting it in the context of the new and making you a religion out of it. <laughs> you, get, you repent and you won't have to worry about praise. And any time you have to teach somebody to praise God, it's of the devil. You don't have to preach, teach somebody to praise God. You let, get, let them meet God. And I'll tell you, if it's all Elijah and his dead bones, you'll come out of there praising God. I mean, you'll come out of there praising God. You meet God, you'll praise God. And if you don't, the rocks will. I can see that bunch out there trying to teach a bunch of rocks how to praise God. Who ever heard of such a ridiculous thing? You meet God by repentance, folk. You run into God's slap, excuse the expression, slap dab into God, you'll praise him. Yes, sir. You won't have to be taught to do it. Somebody will have to hold you down to keep you from it. There's a repentance unto forgiveness. Man says, I have sinned and I have repented, my friends. That man has seen himself as he is. He's so broken over what he sees that he has a change of mind about himself and about God. And there's a choice, my dear friends, that makes you know that he had had a new moral change. And he's not the same man. 
even though he's maybe he's been saved but he's got out of way he come back he's never saved my friend repentance and not only stop there there's a repentance according to Hebrews 6 1 of dead works You say, well, Brother Amanda, what in the world has he been talking about there? You'd be shocked. Are you listening to me? Do you know the difference between religion and Christianity tonight? There's many differences, but you know the basic difference is who initiates it. Jesus defined Christianity when he said, I do nothing except what I see the Father do. The Son of God as the Son of Man never initiated one involvement in his life. Argue with the Scripture. And you know what dead works is? It's what you initiate. That God doesn't initiate. Everything, my dear friends, you've done for God that God did not initiate is religion. And it's dead works. It's not Christianity. Jesus said, I do nothing except what I see the Father do. Well, how to change this world tonight if every man of God would say, Lord, take out of my life everything I've initiated and reduce me to only what you've initiated. It wouldn't be difficult to believe God. So it's hard to believe God when you started something. We go into our budget meetings, you know, and all this. And we sit down with a little computer and a little, uh, what are these things? Calculator, and we figure out what we've got to have. So, okay, God, would you bless us with this here mess? Yeah. <laughs> we haven't taken time to spend time fasting and praying and discovering what God's up to. So we call God in on our little old program and say, Now, Lord, if you bless this. No wonder we have to beg and strut and strive and get in the flesh and act like the devil. You say, But Brother Manley, what you preaching? And the fellow preached that and lived by that. Nothing happened. How do you know? Have you given 30 years of testing? When you have, come back and tell me it won't work. I don't ask you to believe what I say. Come follow me and let's see. Let's see if it works. Everything you've initiated is dead works. Everything I've initiated is dead works. You can repent of that dead works. There's repentance of that dead works. According to Hebrews 6.1. Amen. There's not only a repentance of the dead works, but dear friend, there's a repentance. There's several different repentances. There's, there's even a repentance, I'm not going to deal with it tonight, where you can repent for your nation. My Lord, how we need to repent for this nation tonight. How we need to repent for this murderous nation. How we need to repent for it. I don't know how to get into that. In Revelation, he says, repent and do thy first works. I, as I studied and worked on this message through my heart, through many years, I wondered if that first works and that dead works wasn't about the same thing. And it gets pretty close, but I, I felt like I needed to say something about it. What in the world was he talking about? I remember when I got saved. I, mean, I got saved on Saturday night. And I'm going to tell you one thing, my dear friends, if they had put a piece of tape over my mouth about Jesus, I would have blown up in 500 pieces. I went straight to the joint, drive-in joint, where I had hung out in my car the night I got saved and sat right there on the fender while those boys drank their beer and I told them what happened to me and I couldn't keep it back. And I had such 
such a simple faith, I could believe God for anything He wanted to do. And I was working out of love that was just flowing. My Bible became a book, alive. Witnessing was an overflow. Praying was a conversation with an eternal God. Ah, what glory. He said, repent and get back like you were when you first got saved. That little old childlike simple trust was such an overflow, my dear friends, you can't shut it up. Let me just tell you something. When you have to make yourself read your Bible and pray and discipline yourself into such activities for God, you are not in your first love. We need to repent of our sins till we get back into that first love. And then you will read your Bible. You will win souls. You will pray. You know what I'm doing tonight is taking some of his religion away. Oh, some of you real spiritual because you pray four hours a day. Please turn your tip over for the coaching. you can't keep from it. I think I, I could go home after this meeting because I've already preached more than a lot of you willing to handle these in the night. You say, Brother Manley, you just preaching that to us. You don't preach like that anywhere else. You call them in Dallas, Texas, and ask them what I preached yesterday morning. So a crowd about three times this size. We got a good case of religion, folk, but not much Christianity. He said, repent and do thy first works. What was that first work? In the text, that text there in Revelation 2, he's talking about return to your first love. Return like you were when you first got saved. Whew. Oh, boy. Oh, man, I can remember some of you boys. I see some of you sitting out there. I've known you a long time, friend. And I remember when some of you first got saved, you couldn't shut you up. You couldn't pin you up. You couldn't tie you down. You'd run over every briar patch in East Texas. <laughs> That's right, son. Amen, brother. <laughs> You're so full of God. You didn't have any better sense. Preach at every street corner. Preach in those old jail houses. Preach in those old hospitals. Lying there, friend. Preach everywhere. Preach everywhere. Couldn't stop you. Didn't even get a dime for it. In fact, you had to pay the bills. To get there. But you preached and you prayed and you read your Bible and you loved it. Now you got so spiritual you have to make yourself do all that stuff. He said, repent and return to thy first love. Lord, I suppose quit. Somebody else will preach. Lord, I'm saying everything I know <laughs> about this subject. And I'm not kidding you, folks. Old boy says, I'm not just preaching. This is my heart tonight. And I'm glad that I can share it. But I didn't want to run over on Brother Ron's time if he got here.
Folks, you think I'm kidding about this message, but I'm not. It's not a game with me. I'm only here by the grace of God. And in June of this past year, I told God, when I saw that he's going to let me live and let me travel, I said, Lord, I've got one more lick at the devil. And Lord, if you'll give me the grace, I'll stay committed that this will be the best thing. And I refuse to compromise in the last days. I don't want to get old and sad and ugly and egotistical and full of the devil. Boy, I want to go out shouting as an overcomer. Yes, sir. True. Not only in the word, but in the spirit of the word. Yes, sir, friend. You know, there's another repentance mentioned in the Bible that I hadn't brought up. And I close with this. It's on a sad note, but this is not my last message, I guess, so I, I don't mind close, closing on this note. It's, it's found in Matthew 27, 3. You know what it is? It's the repentance of Judah. Judah, uh, Judah, excuse me. Judas repented. My, what a case. What, what do you think he means, Brother Manley? I think he means, my dear friends, that he saw himself like he really was. I think he really saw himself for what he did was. But my dear friends, I don't think there was a change of mind. And I know there was not a choice to go back to Jesus. He had what the Word of God even calls, in some measure, repentance. A lot of folk, friend, have had stuff that looked like it. But it never comes short of seeing yourself as you are. Having a change of mind about yourself and about God. And then a choice in your heart. I will arise and go to my Savior. It never comes short of that. Judas came short. 